Okay, so this is the beginning of the recording. I'm just going to give a brief intro here. I'm sorry that we forgot to start the recording at the beginning of the presentation. These are presentations from my Kelsey Ford's professor at uh, Professor Kelsey Ford's Women in Literature class, Professor Gale's English Literature 2 class, and my Shakespeare and Film class. And we just had a presentation from the women's literature class, and we're going to move into the English literature two presentations. So English literature two covers the romantic period in England, which started about 1798. And the second part of English literature goes all the way to the present day. I like to tell my students that when I was an undergrad in the 1980s, uh, we, uh, we did not study any female writers in the Romantic period. I just thought there weren't any. They were not in the Norton Anthology, which is what most people used back then. Um, so in the subsequent editions, we started seeing more and more women being represented in the Romantic period, the Victorian period, and of course, into our present day. And now that my class is zero textbook, we have a lot of freedom to add as many women as we want. So um, our project was to, for the students to choose one of the writers that we are studying this semester and to create a Padlet. And um, they had a great deal of freedom about how they organized it. And so I can't wait to hear and see um, what they've come up with. So I'm gonna pull up the Google Doc. You just minimize your thing. Okay. Okay. All right, so we'd like to have Caitlin Holt, come up. To talk about Dorothy Wordsworth. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Holt, and I did my Padlet on Dorothy Wordsworth, as uh, Professor Gale said. Um, specifically, I refer to this one as healing through nature, I think. Yeah. Can screen share. Oh, I see here. It is. There we go. There we are. Wonderful. So, um, Dorothy Wordsworth, uh, unfortunately, because of the nature of her life, she was more of a footnote in her brothers for the longest time until very recently. Um, there's a little bit of conflicting things that dates I've found, but um, a lot of her stuff wasn't published till the about 1900s. Uh, there's some things I found that are, that are dated in the 1800s, but I've, I've once again found conflicting sources on when things were actually published. Um, but when she was eventually found and published, uh, people began to realize how much of an inspiration she actually was for her brother and how much influence she had on the romantic period itself. Um, so here is one of the few portraits we have of Dorothy Wordsworth. There are not very many out there. Um, and some are actually mislabeled as Dorothy when they're actually Dora Wordsworth, William Wordsworth's daughter. Um, so Dorothy was the middle child of five children, uh, all of which were boys besides her. Um, and she was born to John Wordsworth and Anne Cookson, who Anne died when she was six and John died when she was 12. So she went and lived with relatives pretty much a good portion of her early life, um, like taking care of their children. And she only saw her brothers on holidays. Uh, that was until she decided to move out and live with William Wordsworth. Um, uh, because she lived with him, and interacted with a lot of important romantic writers in uh, the romantic period, she had a lot of influence on the period itself. Um, and also sort of like wrote her own 
little romantic bits of poetry, but she mostly focused on diaries and accounts of just her daily life in nature. Um, she never married. She opted to spend the rest of her life living with her brother and his wife uh, in their cottage um, called Dove Cottage uh, out in um, Grassmere, if I remember correctly, yes. Um, despite the fact that she was an unmarried woman and an invalid, uh, her brother and his wife clearly loved her very much and took care of her all the way up to her death, even when she was bedridden. Um, a couple of her important and noteworthy works, uh, Dorothy's Grassmere Journal. Uh, this is one of the most important works in my opinion, because this journal accounts the same daffodil experience that William Wordsworth had that led to his daffodils poem that is very famous today. Um, the Falls of Clyde is another very important work. It exemplifies how much she found healing and peace and respite in nature itself. Um, you could, what I, what I like to say about that specific poem is, whereas other romantic writers like to, to talk about how much they love nature, she showed how much she loved nature. She didn't just say, I love how pretty this is. She was like, I felt completely like, at home in this area, pretty much. Um, uh, then the journals of Dorothy Wordsworth, they're complete recounts of her life. Um, and it includes the Falls of Clyde and the Grassmere journals, but I thought those were important enough to give their own little section. The irregular verses are, it's a poem or set of poems about uh, different children. This one specifically that I noted is a poem about two friends who are in love with nature and the concept of nature growing up. But um, one of the uh, themes in the romantic literature is that people will fall to industrialism. So one friend falls out of love with nature and it figure, uh, prefers the industrial life and the other becomes embarrassed with their continuous love with nature because they see it as childish essentially. Um, and finally, A Winter's Ramble in Grassmere Vale which is pretty much, it's literally a rambling trod through a veil in the middle of winter, just her exploring the idea of nature. Um, and I, I have a very fun link here um, because up here is Dove Cottage, which you can go visit today. I believe it's part of the Wordsworth Museum. Um, and the link I have in the middle here talks about the cottage history. And something I didn't know is that Dorothy, uh, William and William's wife weren't the only people that lived in that cottage in the time frame that they had the cottage. There were actually quite a few people living there and a lot of romantic writers that came and visited them uh, while they lived there. Um, common themes you can find in Dorothy's uh, journals are nature, obviously. Um, and this is the thing that she focused on most. Uh, the daffodils and grassmere, um, the different bodies of water that surrounded where she lived. Um, pretty much everything she wrote about had some like nature-centered focus on it. Um, there was also sort of tranquility and escapism as themes as well in those writings, which all connected back to really uh, back to nature and how nature brought her that tranquility and brought her that escape from the real world and from the rapid industrialization of the world around her. Um, so I have an excerpt here from Grasmere and its daffodils uh, that this is the exact daffodils that actually inspired her brother's poem. When we were in the woods beyond Go Barrow Park, we saw a few daffodils close to the waterside. We fancied the lake that had floated the seas ashore and that the little colony had so sprung up. But as we went along, there were more and yet more. And at last under bows of the trees, we saw that there was a long belt of them along the shore, about the breadth of the country Tumpike Road. I never saw daffodils so beautiful. They grew among the mossy stones about and about them. Some rested their heads upon these stones as a pillow for weariness, and the rest tossed and reeled and danced and seemed as if they were very, barely laughed with the wind that blew upon them over the lake. They looked so gay, ever glancing, ever changing. The wind blew directly over the lake to them. There was here, and there a little knot and a few sorry sorry um, a few yards higher up but they were so few as to not disturb the simplicity and unity and life that of that one busy highway 
Um, and what is interesting about this picture that I've cho cho chosen to show here is, so in Grasmere, they actually created the Wordsworth Daffodil Garden to perfectly mimic the daffodils that the Wordsworth talked about in their time in uh, Grasmere. And you can go visit it today, actually. And the, the pictures I found on the site, which um, I've linked here at the bottom, very beautiful. You can see so much work has gotten into it. Oh, and I, I wanted to mention that this picture here is actually, um, there is an artist who made it her, her like aspiration basically to copy and write, or I'm sorry, no, draw down and bring to life all of Wordsworth's writings the way she saw them basically. And this is one of those pictures of Grasmere uh, Lake. And fin finally, her legacy. So ironically, uh, Dorothy Wordsworth didn't want to be known as an author. Uh, she actually, if I could move, I have pictures in the way of the exact quote. I just wanted to say, she's, she actually said she would detest the idea of herself being a writer and yet here she is in this situation today. Thank you so much. Sorry, I went over time. <laughs> All right, such a great job. Uh, Diana, can we make you co-host because we're not able to admit people when uh, they're presenting. Would that be okay? Oh yeah, of course. Okay, I'm gonna make you co-host. Okay. Just change out the computer, hold on one second. All <laughs> sorts of stuff going on here. It's a bad sign though, if I'm the one, if I'm the tech expert in the, <laughs> in the room. <laughs> Well, you know, we're working with different equipment. You think you get all used to this and then you, you work with something different. Okay, I think we did it. We've got okay. you as our co-host yep. and we are ready to continue. I think we have Iman coming up next, right? Yep. All right, let me close out this one so you can pull up yours. And then whenever you're ready, just go ahead and click your link and it should pull up. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Let me, um, oh. I think I was weird doing weird things earlier. I hope I didn't mess it up when I put it in there. Maybe if I, oh, maybe because sometimes it can act a little funky when, oh, okay, that's weird. I have it on my, <laughs> let's do this really quickly. Let's move on to Calvin and then I'm gonna fix the Google Doc okay. and then it should be okay. okay. All right, sorry about that. That's okay. Fix the Google Doc for my phone. All right. <clears throat> Got a whole setup here. All right. So, how do I share this? It's... You should have to share it. Oh, is it? No. no. Access the Google. Yeah. Google? Oh, I guess we do need to share. There we go. All right. So I did my project on Emily Bronte because her name looked really cool. Uh, she had a really, um, I don't know, it's like weirdly complex, but also to describe it is very simple. She was born in 1818 in Thornton, Yorkshire, England. Uh, she was the fifth child of Patrick Bronte and Maria Branwell. Uh, when she was six, she and her older sisters were sent to a school and due to the terrible conditions and like the neglect of the teachers, uh, her two eldest sisters died of tuberculosis. Um, and then after this, uh, Emily and, uh, her, and Charlotte Bronte were brought back home and they spent the rest of their childhoods there. And um, Emily and Anne uh, came up with this like fantasy world called Gondol. And they wrote all these poems. And I think their brother, Branwell Bronte, wrote uh, or like made art for it. Um, there's some cool, complex lore there, I think. Um, when they got older, Emily and her sisters had to get jobs because their family was uh, poorer. And according to the articles I was reading, that was like quoting some of their work, 
they hated the jobs they had. They like, um, I think especially Emily Bronte like despised children and like hated like their stupid questions and stuff. So that's a lot of fun. Um, um, and eventually they all returned home um, and like did work around, um, I think it was a parish. I don't, I don't remember. Um, and then later Emily and Charlotte went to an academy in Brussels. Um, but after their aunt died, uh, they went back home and I think spent the rest of their lives home. Um, and uh, Charlotte Bronte discovered the Gondel poems from Emily and Anne. And um, together they decided to publish an entire book of poems called Poems um, from, they had pseudonyms to sound more like masculine called uh, Cure, Ellis, Acton, and Bell. And then after um, mostly like little to no success with that, Emily published her novel Wuthering Heights under the same pseudonym and then died the next year of tuberculosis. Uh, so, so for some works so that go into that next. Um, so in the book of uh, poems, the, um, some of the major works um, that she published in that were stars which talks, it's like this love letter to the night and to um, the moon and the stars. And also it's, it discusses how Emily Bronte didn't like the day and sort of the constricting nature of all the responsibilities she had then. Um, and then also in the book of poems is No Coward Soul is Mine, which I think is her most famous poem, uh, which talks about this, um, not fearing death because of like the Im immensity of the universe and the afterlife and immortality. It's really weird and psychedelic for its time. Like it kind of reminds me a lot of um, like White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane. Uh, and then w Wuthering Heights is a Gothic novel that um, describes the tumultuous relationship between Heathcliff and Catherine Earnshaw and how it affects uh, these two families. It has a lot of atmospheric, like creepy cool stuff in it. I started reading it and it's, it's a kind of a weird read. Um, here, um, this, this image here uh, is Tom Hardy as Heathcliff in the mini series they did of that. Um, okay, and then some links that I included, the Bronte secret. Uh, this, this article is kind of weird because it argues that the Bronte sisters work is so like, like the audience for it is so devoted to it. And like they follow it word by word that um, their, their work is almost like the basis for a religion, which I thought was kind of weird, but it gives some really interesting background. Uh, and then another link I included was um, biography.com's description of Emily Bronte. It has like very bare bones, but like really good, like, recording of her life. And then I have a link to No Coward Soul is Mine, which is just a really good poem. You should definitely read it. Um, and then so uh, some themes of her work are infinite immensity, which is this concept of like transcending mortal life and going into the infinite immense like world beyond that. And that's often done in her work through imagination and also death. She, she likes to explore it from different angles. Another theme that's really frequent in her work and her sister's work is imagination. There's a lot of really creative um, uses of like both, both in like the actual writing and in what it's describing. Um, and then for the themes of hope and healing, uh, Emily Bronte went through a lot of like trauma and like mind numbing work and she was able to um, transmute that into really impactful art. Um, and that's it. Um, some of the pictures I included are paintings done by Branwell Bronte. Uh, he was an aspiring artist that I don't think had any success, which is, is kind of sad. Um, and then over in this, Lastly, this image here is from a series about the sisters themselves called To Walk Invisible, which looks pretty cool. And uh, that's it.
Is this screen sharing? I think so. Okay. <laughs> or no. I'm not sure. Second here. Sorry, Leslie, I have to go back into your email and pull it up because I refresh. We have to refresh. Yes, how do I share? How do I screen? I think it's here. Okay. Um, I decided to focus my project on Mary Shelley because I found her novel Frankenstein to be very insightful, but also very creepy. And I think it really reflects a lot of her personal tribulations, but it still centuries later resonates with audiences today. Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin was born to Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin on August 30th, 1797. And because of complications during the child's birth, her mother would actually pass away shortly after. Throughout her childhood, some of the most important romantic writers that we've studied, like William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, would frequent their home. And during these times, Mary would listen to their discussions. She would listen to them recite poetry. And one of the poems that she listened to was The Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, which would later serve as inspiration for her novel, Frankenstein. Although she was deprived of a more formal and structured education, she spent a lot of her time reading in her father's library and by doing so, she was more of self-taught. Later in 1814, she would cross paths with one of her father's students, Percy Shelley. And um, even though he was actually in a relationship at that time and he was married, he was estranged from his wife and he quickly fell in love with Mary. They eloped to Italy and their relationship had a lot of ups and downs. One of the reasons why they traveled throughout Europe so much was because they were actually escaping predators um, they also have a lot of heartbreak and loss in their relationship. They lost three of their children in infancy and early childhood. And they only had one surviving son, Percy Florence Shelley, who actually lived until adulthood. In 1816, Shelley's half-sister died by suicide. And a little bit later, Harriet Westbrook, who was Percy Shelley's first wife, who he was estranged from, also drowned herself. They did champion each other's writings and they did encourage each other to write. But as I mentioned, they had a lot of heartbreak and heartbreak after heartbreak throughout their marriage. And Percy Shelley would later die in 1822 on drowning on a sailing trip. And even after his death, Shelley was able to persevere and continue writing in order to provide for her son. And she dedicated much of her time to healing her husband's reputation in the public sphere. He held a lot of radical views or views that were considered radical at that time. And so he had a bit of a spotty or tarnished um, reputation. In addition to popularizing her husband's work and editing it and trying to heal and salvage his reputation, she had a lot of writing that is, a, um, even though she's mainly known for Frankenstein, I was really shocked to learn that she wrote a lot of short stories, a lot of different short novels. She had a lot of literary criticism, travel narratives, and even biographies that she worked on. Um, her most famous novel, as I've mentioned, Frankenstein, has a very interesting um, origin story. They were The Shelleys were on a trip in 1816. And during this trip, um, Lord, By Lord Byron was there and he challenged the group to a ghost story. And Mary Shelley would write what would later become one of her most acclaimed novels, Frankenstein. The novel itself, if you read it, you can kind of understand how a lot of her personal loss and grief throughout her life could have possibly served as inspiration for the sci-fi novel. Her husband, there's a lot of people who say that her that Victor Frankenstein, the protagonist in the novel, was crafted after her husband. They were both very ambitious, brilliant, and if intense, and a little brooding. She, once she finished the novel and she published it, a lot of people or a lot of publishers felt that it was very grotesque and inappropriate for such a young woman to write um, a novel uh, that was that had so many 
aspects of life and death and torment in it. And a lot of people actually assume that her husband published it. Frankenstein grapples with life and death. It grapples with fractured family dynamics. It also deals with the boundaries that man is willing to push in the name of science and in the name of personal glory. It also touches on the necessity of parenting, motherly love, fatherly love, and the centuries old debate, nature versus nurture. Um, once you read the novel, you know that the creature that Frankenstein brings, creates from death remains nameless. And if I remember correctly, Frankenstein refers to the, his creation as a monster before he even begins to commit monstrous acts. And so all of this really begs the question, was the creature born evil or did his environment force him to be so? And were some of the moral and ethical boundaries within scientific exploration? And when those boundaries are violated, who tends to pay the price? Who are the people who bear the brunt of the negative consequences that come from those explorations? Some of her other novels were The Last Man, which is a dystopian novel set in the 21st century as a pandemic sweeps Europe, which I found really on the nose and a little creepy that she pretty much um, nailed that. Um, there was also another novel, um, <clears throat> Faulkner, which follows a young woman as she's throughout her life and her education and trying to pursue her life under a very almost tyrannical and oppressive father figure. Most of her works um, grapple with themes of life, of loss and grief, of life and death. They also grapple with isolation and the necessity of human connection and what happens to somebody when they're isolated and deprived of connecting with other human beings and how that really curbs human flourishing and does not allow us to reach our full potential. Some of her other works, especially the ones that focus on women trying to achieve and escape from some of, some of the torments in their life and usually the oppressive father or oppressive male figures in their life can also be really construed as critiques of women in society and their roles in society during the Romantic era. Despite the hardships that she really endured throughout her life, I found it very inspirational that she was able to cling on to this hope and create art and not, she didn't just write, but she wrote prolifically and she was constantly writing. And that to me seemed like a form of healing for her that she was able to deal and process a lot of the loss that she was struggling with and the, her losing her mother, losing her children, losing her step, her half sister, losing her husband. And a lot of that was processed in her writing. And even though Frankenstein, as I mentioned in the beginning, really can, can be construed as almost her dealing with a lot of her own loss in her life, it still resonates with audiences centuries later and her ability to willing to heal her husband's reputation even after losing him and to provide for her son even after he lost his father all speak to her incredible strength in the face of unspeakable trauma and grief and pain. Thank you so much for listening to Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. Um, hi guys, I'm Yami. Um, I made my Padlet on Virginia Woolf. And the reason I chose her was because I think of her as a poet that could never catch a break. Um, she always had some type of grief going on in her life. And she definitely showed her talent um, through her uh, writing. And even though she went through so much, she still managed to be super talented in her writing and her work. 
So um, she is basically an English writer considered among the most important in the 20th century. Um, during her, when she was beginning to write in her life, she suffered a lot of loss, which was from her family, her mom, her dad, and her sister. Um, she was born in January 25th, 1882 in Kensington, London. Um, she was very well educated. She was part of the London upper class. Um, her dad was a scholar and he was very uh, educated. He gave her the education she needed and um, he wanted her to have like very high education. Uh, she got private lessons. Uh, she had access to her father's library. which was how she began um, writing because she was very uh, interested in books and reading and learning from her dad. Um, I added on here that she made uh, annual summer migrations to her townhouse in Talent, uh, in townhouse to the Talent House. Uh, basically the reason why I added this on here was because most of her poetry was because of these um, symbols and influences when she would go over there and like see the sea, see the birds, see the nature, and she would kind of resonate to uh, all those symbols and put it in her writing. Uh, then um, Wolf's mother passed away in 1995 when she was just 13 years old. Um, her sister passed away two years later. Uh, she, was also, she was very depressed after that had happened. Uh, her writing was another way for her to distract herself and not fall into that deep depression hole where she just, just didn't want to live. Um, but because, because of all this grief, she be began to write and create poetry. Um, Unfortunately, uh, she did fall into that deep depression hole. Um, she hit depression on March 28th, 1941 during that time and she actually committed suicide. Uh, she drowned herself by walking into a river wearing an overcoat with pockets filled with stones. Her body was found on April 18th, 1941. Her major works was uh, Night and Day. It was a novel that follows a 25 year old uh, Captain Hilberry a beautiful and privileged member of a historically renowned family. Uh, basically there is how she uh, portrays and symbolizes how women in uh, during that time were treated and how they acted in higher society. Uh, one of her famous works was Mrs. Dalloway in 1995. It was a high society English woman who uh, basically a day in the life of an English woman. Uh, it followed how she, who she, she talked to, connected with uh, her experiences meeting people and how she was treated by that day. Uh, another one of her works was To the Lighthouse in 1925, or 1927, sorry. Um, here she showed uh, her flawless prose and temptation of human emotions. Uh, she explores the human fear of change in a new and compelling way and her ability to make descriptions come to life. The Waves in 1931 uh, composed of six monologues, one by, one by each of the book's main characters, which will use to delve into notions of identity, individuality, and society. Oh. Some of her major themes in her works was imperfect marriage, uh, basically the suggestion that the marriages are marked with some conflict and turmoil. Uh, she, one, another major theme was women in society, uh, establishing the necessity for women to have financial and intellectual independence because women at this time were never able to have that since men were more dominant uh, roles. Truth, Wolf forces her readers to question the veracity of everything she has presented as truth so far. Uh, another one would be feminism. Virginia Woolf's major contribution to literature is typically thought to be her feminist critic of society. She was very advanced of her time. She actually is a really good example of how women were never given a voice during that time. And she made a, a beautiful connection on how gender roles were a big problem and how they should be uh, fixed. Oh, sorry. 
Um, basically, overview of character. She was a biographer, essayist, novelist, critic. She wrote many uh, novels. Unfortunately, she, oh. Uh -oh. Um, overall, for the National Women's Month Appreciation, Wolf created an encouraging influence in her work for women. Uh, she should be celebrated this month to honor her amazing work in creating beautiful art that had a huge impact on society, culture, and society, and history, sorry. Okay. Excuse us one moment here. Is that somebody's windows? So the main reason I picked the person I picked is because she has a really, really weird name. And because I really um, agreed with one of the messages she put out on her TED Talks about the whole, like, not to judge people, like, too quick or something like that. She was born. She was born in Nigeria on uh, September fifteenth, nineteen seventy-seven. She moved to the United States. Wait, yeah, nineteen seventy-seven, and she moved to the United States in nineteen ninety-seven and attended many schools such as Yale, Eastern Connecticut, and John Hopkins. She is a author, author, teacher, novelist, as well as a poet who earned the Commonwealth Writers Prize after publishing her first novel at Eastern Connecticut in 2003. Uh, she married her husband in 2009. For their wedding, they decided to break several conventional norms associated with weddings, such as how the um, dad walks the bride down the aisle and has the first dance with the daughter and delivers a speech for the for their basically the and basically the mom doesn't, but for her she had her mom do like all those things. Uh, for her little her sample thing, I put the um, a little sample from one of her things called uh, "We Should All Be Feminists." The impact of her work. Uh, basically, she wanted the American readers to know that the African writers don't only write about Africa's problems. Problems, and from her interview on the, on her uh, TED talk, she wanted people not to judge. She wanted people not to judge people because of her own experiences from Nigeria and her experience and her first time in America. Uh, for a little thing, I put um, if we only hear about a about a people, place, or situation from one point of view, we risk accepting one experience as the whole truth. She went and became a very popular poet from Nigeria, who was best known for her themes of politics, culture, race, as well as gender. everyone. My name is Diego. Um, I decided to do my Padlet on Beatrix Potter. And to introduce her, I'm actually going to use the name, of one of my sources down here. Um, That's it. She, uh, if you don't know her, Beatrix Potter was an author, naturalist, and mycologist. 
Um, and so she lived a life of many different facets. And this was brought on from her early life and childhood uh, where she grew up in a very well-off family, not necessarily wealthy, but they had enough money to be able to instruct her and educate her at her house. Um, her family though, growing up in Victorian times as she was born in 1866, uh, they fell victim to uh, many gender and classist issues that Victorian families all fall <laughs> victim to. So she kind of was forced to follow along with her father's wishes to go with an education in nature. And so that really shaped her career for the most part as she took a really vested interest in this. And so she, as I said earlier, she became really interested in mycology, which is the study of mushrooms. Um, she also uh, wrote 30 books, 23 of which were children's literature, which she is most famous for. Um, Peter Rabbit is her most famous work, which is depicted here. Um, she had a really prolific career. She painted 350 paintings of mushrooms and lichen and whatnot. And um, her work was so important that she actually was submitting a research paper to the Linnaean Society of London, which she was denied to attend because she was a woman at the time and they didn't allow women into the scientific uh, sphere at the time. So she experienced gender discrimination at home, in the business place, all over the place, which helped shape some of her themes in her works. So Beatrix Potter, although she wrote for literature, that didn't stop her from writing about difficult topics. So as I mentioned, she kind of fell victim to gender discrimination, uh, although she wasn't very poor, she was aware of classism and class inequality. So with her first publication, Peter Rabbit here, she actually was self-published, which is incredibly difficult to do even now, especially so in Victorian times as a woman. Um, so she was able to self-publish and also it was just a monumental achievement for literature because she was able to combine this interest in gorgeous illustrations, be able to captivate children's imaginations. And also it was appealing to the lower classes because they could actually afford this at the time. So she really <laughs> was like a groundbreaking kind of author in, in that sense. Um, this one quote that I wrote, or found rather, um, sorry, <laughs> um, so I'll talk about my links, I guess. So this link right here, Beatrix's Potter contribution to children's literature between reality and narrative representation. That one was really interesting because it shows how she's kind of a product of her time and social restrictions. So as I mentioned, she definitely played into and made art that was resulting from classism, gender inequality, all, all these kinds of things. And just really quickly, I would like to touch on how this she relates to this year's theme of Women's History Month, which is providing hope and promoting healing. And so Beatrix Potter was a children's literature author and it's important to be able to, so with her story, she sought to kind of change our, a shift in culture and how we viewed society. And she addressed all these Victorian, as here, Victorian inequality and artificiality that she saw and didn't really like. So she 
wrote about characters and themes that would address those and promote this change and inspire children and next further generations to become better. I don't think so. I'll have to ask. Do you need to get rid of that stuff? He needs to mute. <laughs> Oops, sorry, I just muted everybody. But now I realized I also muted you. <laughs> Thank you. We have one more Padlet presentation for the English Literature 2 class, and then we will be moving into the Shakespeare presentation. So we have two Shakespeare presentations after this. Please bear with us if we run a little bit late since we had some issues at the beginning, but I hope you will enjoy this last presentation and then we will move right into the next ones for Shakespeare. Okay. Before I start presenting, I'm just gonna say that if my voice gets shakier or I sound like I just got out of a treadmill, I talk really fast and my newly COVID damaged lungs cannot keep up with me. So um, today I'm going to be doing my presentation on Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. She was born in Kilo, Kilo, United Kingdom on March 6th to Edward and Mary Moulton. She didn't have a great um, relationship with her father. And yeah, she didn't have a great relationship with her father. I'm not going to get into that. Um, she had many health problems. She also lost many siblings due to illnesses like fever. One of her brothers died from fever in Jamaica, not necessarily tuberculosis like you guys have seen a lot in other poets, a lot of other illnesses that they just didn't have the medicine for at the time. Um, she had her own health problems. She had asthma like me and she uh, um, had a spinal injury which left her confined to her room for a while. Her parents had a, a bulk of land so a lot of her poetry has a lot of nature just due to the fact that she was confined to her house for so long that she was just taking in what was around her. Um, um, she had a big passion for writing. She began, she began to publish things. I think she published her first book at 14 years old. She started writing poetry at six. Um, and then she has a passion for spirituality as well, which you'll see in her poetry later on as well. Um, her father did not accept her and Robert Browning's relationship, so she runs away, goes to Italy, and leaves all of that behind her. Um, she actually went to Italy to also heal herself because of her asthma and her trouble with breathing. The air quality there is better for her, um, and she went there in hope for um, a better future and longed to heal from the past that she had with her family, um, and then once she found hope and healing. She wrote it to help others so that they never lose hope as well. Um, right next to the picture um, on the far left side, that's her and Robert Browning. They got married September 12th, the day before my birthday. So that's cool. Um, um, some of her accomplishments, she actually never won an award. Maybe it was just too early on. She was a runner up. I think it was Tennyson actually ended up winning the award that she was running for but that doesn't mean she didn't accomplish anything. Like I said before, by the age, she started writing poetry at six. She started writing French dramas by 10 and she published a book by 14, which makes me think, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> um, major and most popular works. Um, one of the most popular ones that I saw was How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Ways. This became one of the most famous readings used as what, at weddings. Um, it was published in 1850. The second one would be Bianca Among the Nightingales. It's believed to be published in 1844, but there's really no date. I tried looking very hard through everything and there was nothing. Um, the Runaway Slave at Pilgrim's Point, that was published in 1847. The Musical Instrument were in 1860. You guys might've heard from about these, I haven't. My favorite ones though, were The Cry of the Children and the son sonnets from the Portuguese, specifically the sonnets from Portuguese 22. This is when they talk about the two souls stand erect talks about equality. Um, major themes shown throughout her work are going to be social injustice, specifically women and children's rights. We see that in the Cry of the Children, spirituality and religion. We see that in the Sonnets of the Portuguese and nature. We see that in the Sonnets of the Portuguese as well. Um, she explores social injustice um, just due to what she, see, she had seen in both Italy and the United Kingdom and America. She spent a lot of her time at home, which is why she explored nature throughout her 
um, poetry. And then the biggest theme that we can see, oh, the PC is about to die, um, is that she looked through love, which you'll see a lot of that through um, her poetry about with Robert Bear Brown. This is gonna die soon. So I'm just gonna close this up for everybody. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I'm just gonna end it there. <laughs> okay, all sorts of issues, but we have two more presentations coming over to you. And I am going to give just a brief introduction. So the introduction to Shakespeare and film class, we decided to focus the Padlets on the two plays that we've studied so far. And we saw two films for each of these plays. In each of those films, uh, there were different representations of the female characters within the plays. So these Padlets are highlighting some of those differences and what the students have discovered about the way they were portrayed in film. I think it'll last for the last two. It's just a little low. It's gonna go fast. Is it even in there though? Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties again with the battery. We're gonna to try to get this plugged in, but this is not the correct plug and I don't know if it's working. Oh, it looks like it's working. Cool. All right. These are the students for Much Ado About Nothing. <laughs> Um, so for Much Ado About Nothing, I'll be doing a little bit of analysis on the two characters we chose for the film adaptations of the play, uh, Margaret and Beatrice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Margaret in Kenneth Branagh's Much Ado About Nothing, she wears like this white and flowy dress which symbolizes purity and this whole adaptation, it kind of is very much so idyllic compared to the one that we'll be discussing later. And it shows these, this very like happy-go-lucky kind of like almost commune kind of type living where these people are happy. <laughs> so we noticed that Margaret kind of tends to be, she's shown to be older and almost like a caretaker, like a nurse, like a wizened, like a mentor to the lovers in the story. Um, She's shown to be like a maid as she's shown here in maid's clothing, but it's not all that too different from Beatrice who's shown here. It's not all that different compared to these two. So it shows that although there is a little bit of a power dynamic difference, it's not necessarily as pronounced as in the other film. Um, it's more so the age difference that defines them in this <laughs> adaptation. Um, she doesn't really take that much of a lead role in this she very much so falls to the wayside and she's only there to like advise the other characters and as for beatrice here it is she is a very <laughs> uh independent woman in both adaptations but she's much more so in the kenneth branagh version um she's very much so well known for her wit and her leadership and she's incredibly intelligent. She has these playful banters with Benedict who's one of the lead male characters. Um, so now I'll talk about Margaret and Beatrice in Whedon's version of Much Ado About Nothing. Um, so a lot of the differences in Margaret's character have to do with her, um, how she's physically shown. So she has actually a maid costume, which is a constant reminder of her role in society and her role in this family. Um, she doesn't um, fit in. It's a very constant reminder of her lack of power, especially. Um, she's also around the same age as Hero and Beatrice, which um, kind of emphasizes her beauty and also something that men can take from her um, later on in the movie. Um, in scenes, uh, she's absent from scenes like the wedding, where um, I think it really emphasizes her lack of choice and her lack of power in the situation regarding um, Braccio. She is kind of used as a pawn. Um, and 
She also appears to be uncomfortable in the scene with Braccio and is completely um, unaware of how she's being used. And it also kind of highlights maybe her lack of choice in that situation. And then for Beatrice, she's very isolated um, from the rest of the family in Whedon's version. There are scenes like um, the courtyard where she leaves the rest of the family and then Benedict ends up leaving her um, after she is grieving Hero's fake death. Um, she is left alone to grieve until Benedict comes and kind of acts as a savior and they work out a plan together. And she's also um, also seen as holding a wine glass almost all of the film, which um, kind of shows that she might be dependent on some unhealthy coping mechanisms. <laughs> um, and um, so when she hears the news that Benedict likes her, she's actually hiding under the kitchen counter, which I think shows her separation and isolation from the rest of the family as well. Um, and then for how they're similar, um, Margaret in both films is used as a pawn. She doesn't have any choice in how she's used against Hero. Um, both of them also do break stereo, uh, break gender roles though. Um, in um, uh, Beatrice is educated and at a time where that is probably not likely for a woman, she starts the film by reading and singing and is kind of a leader in the sense, in social sense at least. And she's also not a very bubbly or uh, outgoing person in Whedon's version, which kind of breaks the stereotype of women should be this perfect host and uh, should kind of bring everyone together. And then for B, or, and then for, um, sorry. Oh, and also um, uh, Beatrice uh, telling uh, Benedict to kill Claudio is one of the only times a woman actually has a choice. In each film, it is the only time where a woman really makes an impact on a man to do some kind of action that impacts the plot. Uh, apologies. Okay. All right. So hopefully this works out well. You can see everything. Oh, pictures are loading. All right. So we have to go ahead and start. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so our Padlet is on Romeo and Juliet's female cast. And so we looked at Shakespeare's films and, sorry, plays and the ways that the women were portrayed in it, and we compared it to two different films. The first film is Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet, which came out in 1968, and it starred uh, Leonard Whiting as Romeo and Olivia Hussey as Juliet, and what's kind of interesting about this movie is that it was very neorealist. It was shot on location in Italy, and it featured younger actors, which was pretty atypical at the time. Um, the the other movie we're going to look at is Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, which came out in 1996, and it starred Leonardo DiCaprio as Romeo and Claire Danes as Juliet. And as you can kind of see by the movie poster there, um, it's not just two families feuding. It's kind of more of a game where they're like pointing guns at each other. Um, and so there's also an emphasis on criminality and action that other adaptations just don't have. All right, so first we're going to talk about uh, Rosaline. And in Shakespeare's play, she doesn't even appear at all. Uh, she doesn't have any lines or anything, uh, but she's important because she's Romeo's first love. Um, because Romeo figured that uh, she was at the Capulet party, he decided to go and there he found Juliet. So she's important plot wise. Um, she's often described in the play by other people, often associated with just how much Romeo loves her. And um, um, of herself, we just know that she's very beautiful and that she's just not really super interested in romance. 
All right, in Zeffirelli's version, it's kind of exciting. We get to see an actress actually playing her. Um, and you can kind of see her here. She kind of has these darker clothes on and kind of like a sour expression on her face. Um, and she serves as a foil to Juliet. If you can see from a picture on the right, she's in red and she looks like happier and more cheerful. So Rosaline just looks a lot less ready to be in love. Um, but it's great um, for her agency, for Rosaline's agency, because she can describe herself with her actions, whereas um, in other versions, she's just talked about. Uh, in Lerman's version, uh, she loses a lot of agency as a person because she doesn't even appear. She has no actress portraying her. She still has the same plot uh, significance. Uh, you know, Romeo still goes to that party, but because other lines are cut for time as well, uh, she's less of a person and more of a plot device, so she loses a lot of agency there. All right, the next person I'm going to talk about is Lady Montague, which is Romeo's mother. She doesn't have a super significant role either, um, but she um, loves Romeo, we know that, and she's also something of a peacemaker. Um, at the very beginning of the play, she urges her husband not to go fight the Capulets, um, and so that's some defining traits of hers. In Zeffirelli's version, um, if you can kind of see by this picture here, she's kind of embracing her husband and she's begging him not to go out and fight the Capulets. Unfortunately, however, he goes out and fights them anyway, um, but she's still here as a peacemaker and she's kind of pleading him. In Lerman's version, however, uh, she still fulfills that role as a peacemaker, but if you can kind of see from her face there, there's kind of a steel behind it. She's kind of daring her husband to go out there um, and uh, she's, um, she's saying he will not and he doesn't, he stays inside. And so in Lerman's version compared to Zeffirelli, she has a lot more steel. She's still a peacemaker. She's still a good mother, but she has more confidence to her now. Um, unlike Lady Montague, Lady Capulet is not a good mother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the play, you can see that she often, uh, you know, she forgets Juliet's age um, and she even like um, leaves Juliet to fend for herself when her father, Lord Capulet, you know, lashes out on her. Um, in Zeffirelli's film, you can see Lady Capulet. Um, she has this sour face. She does not like her husband. Um, this also can come from like the play how uh, she was married at a very young age. Um, this is um, Lady Capulet depending on the nurse for Juliet's uh, emotional develop development. <laughs> um, in uh, this film, uh, Lady Capulet is still is preoccupied by her appearance as uh, she's kind of self-centered and is not as dependent on the nurse. Um, we can see it in the play of, and during the party, uh, she often um, talks to Juliet and pushes her towards Paris. Um, in this film, uh, they, <laughs> Lady Capulet is scared of her husband. Uh, you can see during the scene I mentioned earlier, um, she leaves Juliet the femme for herself out of fear and she wanted to protect herself. What I noticed in both films is that um, they portray Lady Capulet as a cheater. She cheats with Tybalt. <laughs> okay, uh, the nurse kind of plays as um, Juliet's mother. Uh, you can see here uh, the nurse standing behind Juliet while she talks to her mother, Lady Capulet. Um, <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, Juliet is a very complex character. She uh, develops a lot during the scene. In Zeffirelli's film, she's portrayed a bit differently. We see her shown as a young 13 year old girl. In, Fast film, she's kind of shy and obedient. <laughs> but um, uh, she's a little bit older in this film, which is because um, in the play she was 13 and she is more confident in this film. There's a kind of interesting part near the end where uh, she's trying to get help from Friar Lawrence. And so she pulls out a gun and threatens him. So she's very confident. She knows what she wants. <laughs> um, and so um, this was just um, our analysis.
synopsis of the cast of Romeo and Juliet. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Just want to thank everyone for their hard work and willingness to present. We would really like to thank um, professors Diana Reed and Anastasia <laughs> Panagakos for um, their excellent um, series for Women's History Month. And we feel so privileged to have been the last presentation for this year's Women's History Month. Thank you so much. and. Um, all of these Padlets that you've seen will be made available. Uh, so you can be watching for them as well as the recording. So have a great day and um, happy end of March. Thank you.